Uh, we're so blessed, guys. You, many of you know a couple weeks ago when the hurricane hit the Bahamas that we purposed in our heart, we're going to do something immediately. We're going to respond, and, and the church did. You know you guys filled that outreach truck from the front to the back with supplies. Can you give God praise for that, man? That truck was packed from the front to the back with supplies, and it was so awesome to see members of volunteers of our outreach team, Dream Team, that actually went to the hangar to help sort those supplies and help to weigh everything else out and get it balanced and and just prepare it for travel over to the Bahamas. So that was really awesome just seeing that. So all those who gave up on your Saturday to go over there and to do that, man, God bless you. Thank you for being the hands and feet of Jesus yesterday. God bless you. Amen. If you're here and you're like, man, I really want to make a difference. I'm telling you, you're at the right church. This is a church where you can make a difference. You can make an impact. So stay tuned, watch, uh, follow us on uh, Instagram and and be a friend with us on on Facebook so you can always stay up to date with what's going on and what the church is doing so you can be a part. And so today is For the One Sunday and at Lakeside we make a promise to every single person that walks into this church. We don't care who you are, where you came from. We don't care what you know or what you don't know. We're just excited you're here and for every one person that walks in, We make a promise that this is a church where you can find faith. The reason why we promise that is because every week we preach the gospel. Amen. Because every week we share the good news of Jesus Christ. And so we're confident this is a place where you can find faith. I'm so confident of that that there was already seven people in the first service that gave their life to Jesus. Come on. Come on. You can do better. Come on. You can do better. That's what I'm talking about. Come on. Like, like, like we're only in the first service of four. We already got seven people that said, I believe in Jesus. I want to receive Christ. And if you don't know already, let me be the first one to tell you, we get fired up by people coming to faith in Jesus. And we take our cues from heaven because heaven gets fired up about people coming to faith in Jesus. I and mean, the Bible says the angels in heaven rejoice over one one and so already seven this morning we're so excited and I firmly believe that even in this service right now there's probably at least one person here today that that would say pastor I'm kind of searching I'm kind of I'm trying to feel this thing out I I I didn't grow up in the church or maybe you did grow I don't know what your situation is but I'm believing I'm hoping and I'm praying that there's one person at least one in this service today who is ready to at least just hear more about who God is and who Jesus is and what he's done. So we promise you can find faith. And then secondly, that you can find a family. Amen. A place to belong, a place to belong to, a place where you can do life with other people. Like there was a group of people yesterday that went to the hangar and just started ministering together. You know what that is? Family. It's what family does. You're like, man, I want that. I need that. Well, you're going to have to give up a Saturday sometimes. Like, like, how bad do you want that? If you want it bad enough, you're going to make some sacrifice. You're going to go. You're going to connect. And so we promise you can find family here at Lakeside. You know, I met with my group for the very first meeting, Caroline and I, this Wednesday night. Some of the most amazing people I immediately fell in love with this group of people. And guess what we're doing? That's family. We meet together outside of Sunday morning. We met on Wednesday night and just gathered in a circle and just listened to everybody's story and how they got here and how they found us and what God's doing. And that's what family does does meets together and talks and connects and prays with one another and reads the word together and so you can find faith you can find family now watch this the last two are so important most people overlook them that God wants you not only saved but he wants you free it's possible to be born again but still be broken I know a lot of people born again I believe you're on your way to heaven you believe in Jesus Christ you've received him but the truth is there's so many areas of your life where you're still stuck in fear and you're stuck in depression, you're stuck in anxiety, you're stuck in addiction, you're stuck. Jesus Christ came not just to save you, but to set you free. And so this is a place, amen, where you can find freedom. In fact, the way we do that is through groups called freedom groups that are going on right now. And so we'd love for you. If you're here today, it's like, man, I need freedom. You need a freedom group so we can walk you through the process of finding freedom. And then the last promise is fulfillment. 
everybody's looking. If you were here last Sunday, you know that's what we talked about, fulfillment. Everybody's looking for fulfillment. Fulfillment comes when you understand who you are in Christ and you understand how God designed you and you know your purpose and you start living that purpose out. Incredible fulfillment comes through that. And so we can walk you through that process. I want to take you to the book of Acts chapter 16. I want to share a story with you today. But before we go to verse 24, I want to go to verse 5 because as I was studying this week, I read this. I'm like, oh, the whole church needs to hear this. In in Acts chapter 16, verse 5, the Bible says the churches were, and they, two things, notice about the church, the early church, they were strengthened in their faith, like every time you come to church, you ought to be strengthened in your faith. Every time, if you sat in a service, man, you ought to have more faith walking out than you did walking in. The church should be a place that strengthens and encourages and builds up. And so notice that in the early church, they were strengthened in their faith. But watch this. Something happened when their faith got strengthened. The church grew larger. Take a look around the room this morning. Like there's not a whole lot of space this morning. But this is a good thing. This is a good thing. I don't want anybody saying, no, the church has to get smaller. Wrong. It has to get bigger. Why? Why? Because when we are strengthened in our faith and we start to live out that faith and we go beyond just casual Christians who show up to hear a word and walk out. No, when we actually receive faith and start living out faith, we're going to make an impact. We're going to change lives. We're going to lead people to faith in Christ. And what's going to happen? The church is going to grow. Church is going to grow. So I just wanted to throw that out there so you see that directly in Scripture. Go to verse 24. Verse 24, this is my passage for today. The jailer, I want to focus on the jailer. I think whenever you go to Acts 16, there's a natural tendency to go straight to Paul and Silas and to focus on the miracle that happens. And I'm not minimizing the miracle. It's an amazing thing. I love it. But I want to focus on this jailer today because we don't even get his name. We just get his occupation, what he did. He's the jailer. You know what I'm thinking in my heart? There might be some people today who can relate to this guy. That's what I'm thinking, that God gave me this text because there's maybe some people who can identify with this guy. The jailer put them into the inner dungeon and clamped their feet in the stocks. Watch this. And around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening. And suddenly there was a massive earthquake, and the prison was shaken to its foundations, and all the doors immediately flew open, and the chains of every person fell off. This is what God does. Then he opens up prison doors, and he takes chains, and they just begin to fall off in the name of it. Can I get a witness from one person who's been set free? Come on. One person. This is what God does. This is the God we serve today. Man, he opens up prison doors and he breaks off chains. Watch this, very next verse. And the jailer woke up to see the prison doors wide open. He assumed the prisoners were escaping, so he drew his sword, probably put it down to fall on it. And the Bible says he was about to kill himself when Paul shouts out to him, says, no, don't kill yourself, man. We're all here. Nobody's left. And the jailer called for lights. There's something significant about that, man. If you're in darkness, you need to call for light. I believe there might be some people here today, man. You're, 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 you're just going through some dark times right now. Guess what? God is a light. And God wants to illuminate every dark area of your life. He'll do it today if you're ready to receive. And watch this. He called for the lights. He ran to the dungeon. And he fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. And then he brought them out. Watch this. He asked this question. It's an extremely important question. He says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? I, I need, I'm telling you, that question is the most important question you will ever ask. It's more important than who am I going to marry? What type of occupation am I? What, what, what kind of career? Where am I going to go to college? University of Florida? You're going to have all these questions. <laughs> Right? You're going to have all these questions. And this right here is the most important question. What must I do to be saved? And let me just say, like, all, all my owners here at Lakeside, like, we got to answer this question correctly. Because you really jack people up when you don't answer this question correctly. When people say, what do I have to do to be saved? And then you throw out a lot of religious stuff, it doesn't help people. 
and make stuff work. And the church has done that. The church has been known to throw out a lot of, you know what I'm talking about? A lot of religious stuff. There's an answer to this question. I'm going to answer it today. What must I do to be saved? So, Father God, in the next 25, 30 minutes that you give us together, God, take the preaching of this word today, God, and God, anoint it. Because if your anointing's not on it, God, it's nothing. It's, it's a guy up here talking, having a discussion. But, God, if you anoint the words of my mouth, then they go forth like fire people's hearts like wood and the word just consumes us today it's not our preaching it's your power it's not our word it's your word I believe there may be people here today that are asking the question but what do I have to do be saved there may be some people here today who've asked the question and got the wrong answer so today Holy Spirit help me to lay this out according to your word according to your scripture so that we can answer this question correctly in Jesus name and all God's people said Acts chapter 16, verse 16. Let me just provide a little bit of context to the text. So we're going to go up just a couple verses before where we were. So the Bible says in verse 16, one day as we were going to the place of prayer, it's Paul, Silas, uh, Luke, I think Timothy was here too, I believe. We met a slave girl who had a spirit that enabled her to tell the future. She earned a lot of money for her masters by telling fortunes. Uh, I, I just want to throw this out here real quick. Like if any of you are out here and you're calling psychic hotlines and you're playing tarot cards, I'm telling you, you're talking to demons. I know Mama Cleo comes on at three o'clock in the morning. Y'all know who, y'all know who Mama Cleo is? Y'all remember that? Like that Jamaican lady, like come on at two o'clock in the morning, Mama Cleo wants to read your, your fortune. And, t- and some of y'all call it. I'm telling you, you're calling the devil. Call it Mama Cleo if you want to, but there's a spirit behind that, and it's demonic. And in Acts, Acts chapter 16 right here, there's a girl who is possessed with a demon. She's telling fortunes. And watch this. She follows Paul around, and she starts shouting out, these men are servants of the Most High God, and they have come to tell you how to be saved. Isn't it interesting that even the enemy knows the purpose of Paul and Silas? That means he knows your purpose. That means he he knows what God wants to do through you. And so it's interesting that this girl's just following Paul and Silas around as they're going around preaching the gospel and preaching salvation. And actually, she's like shouting to everybody everywhere they go, these are the servants of the Most High God. They're they're preaching. uh, They're telling everybody how to be saved. And I think like the first day, Paul's like, man, this is free marketing. Paul's like, I don't even have to raise my voice. This girl's doing it for me. So, so for a day or two, I mean, he's just got this free billboard. The devil's like a free billboard, just walking around, just advertising for Paul and Silas, gathering people together, and then Paul would tell them how to be saved. And so it's kind of cool until about the third day. Is, has he ever had something be cool, but then three days later, it ain't cool no more? And so on the third day, Paul's like, no, I'm tired of this stuff. And so he turns around and he rebukes the spirit. He rebukes that demonic spirit that's in that girl. Notice this. He doesn't hate the girl. He's able to discern that there is a spirit behind. I wish we would be strong enough in our faith that we would learn not how to hate people, but how to know the motivation. The mo- oh, I feel fired up already. That we would be able to see the motivation behind people that it's not them, it's the enemy. Right? And so Paul can do that. And so he revealed. And I just want to point out that there's no battle. There's no cataclysmic fight or there's no struggle. Paul says, hey, enemy, devil, you're out of here. Boom, gone. I just want you to understand that. God and Satan are not equals. Man, God is supreme. He's sovereign. And Satan's way down lower than here. I love what Jesus said. I saw Satan fall like lightning out of heaven. No battle, no struggle. You got to go. Poof, he's gone. Period. And so this is what happens. And so Paul just uses uh, his authority and he commands that evil spirit to come out. Now the problem is the men who own this girl now realize that they're not going to make any more money because the girl now not being uh, used by demonic pressure. So anyways, they get upset. They put hands on Paul and Silas. They arrest them. They get a mob going. They strip them of their clothes. They beat them. They give them to the jailer. The jailer then takes them, puts them in the dungeon. 
in the, uh, puts, uh, puts them in the stocks and right in the deepest part of the jail. And the Bible says that around midnight, Paul and Silas begin to pray and to worship God and God begins to move. This is the good part, you know, I mean, like an earthquake comes and, and just so you know, what a coincidence, the earthquake came at that moment. Well, one coincidence because doors started opening. I mean, like, like chains started falling off. Whenever you get in the presence of God, doors will start opening. Whenever you get in the presence of God, that's why I like Lakeside, because Lakeside's a place that if you get in, doors are about to start opening and shackles are about to start coming off. You say, how do you know that? Because it happened for me in Jesus' name. And so this is exactly what happens. And when the jailer wakes up, he sees doors open and he knows immediately, I'm a dead man. I'm a dead man because a jailer was responsible to keep the prisoners. And if a prisoner got out, the jailer would be killed. And so the jailer takes the sword and, and prepares to kill himself. And Paul sees and he says, stop, what are you doing? Don't harm yourself. We're all here. Nobody's left. And the Bible says the man calls for a light. And when the light is brought to him, he runs over to Paul and he says these words, what must I do to be saved? What's interesting to me is that the way this story starts, Paul is in prison and the jailer is free. But actually... Paul was in prison, but he was more free than the jailer who was supposedly free, but who was in prison. Praise God. And the way we know that's true is because as soon as things get bad, the jailer tries to kill himself. Now, now, now we, we got to deal with this subject of suicide because we're seeing this thing like all the time. This, this, this thing, suicide, is, it's coming up in front of us continually. And I want you to know today that suicide is Satan's attempt to steal your purpose. I want you to see suicide for what it is. It's an attempt of the enemy to steal your destiny and to steal your purpose. You were created in the image of God. Your life has value. Your life has meaning. Your, your life has purpose. God wants to do something great through you. So what does the enemy do? I'll tell you exactly what he does. He tries to steal that. He tries to take that. John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus said this. Watch, the thief's purpose... This is his purpose, is to steal, kill, destroy. That's the purpose of the enemy. That's what he's like. The enemy's not your friend. The enemy's not your buddy. He's not your pal. Like, like he, he may act like it, but I promise you, ultimately, he's trying to do one of three things, Jesus said. But watch this. God's got a purpose also. Jesus says, my purpose is to give you a rich and a satisfying life. I love that. God says, I've come that you might have life eternal, but even have abundant life right now. This is why I say, God not only wants you saved, he wants you healed. He wants you set free. He wants those bondages broken. God did not save you to live the rest of your life depressed. God did not save you for you to stay anxious for the rest of your life. No, he came that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. So when the question is asked, what must I do to be saved? Here's the quick answer. Receive eternal life. I mean, let's, let's, let's keep this simple because God keeps it simple. And then what religion does, we come in and we complicate things. Keep it simple. What do I have to do to be saved? Well, you just receive eternal life. You receive it. And that word receive means to accept. You just accept it. You just, like if I had something to give to you today and I just reach out, you just put your hand forth and you just take it in. You just accept it. You just grasp it. That's how you receive eternal life. God offers it and we accept it. Are you with me so far? Acts chapter 16, verse 27, the Bible says that the jailer woke up to see that the prison doors were open. He assumed the prisoners had escaped, so he drew his sword to kill himself. And it's in this moment that Paul shouts out to him, says, don't do it. Like, that, that's our role here at the church. Like, what role does the church play? And this, I'm telling you what role. We shout to people and say, don't hurt yourself. Don't throw in the towel. Don't give up. Don't, don't ruin your life. This is the message that the church has to get out there for a bunch of people who are out there just, just giving in to the enemy. You know what I found out? Life can get dark. I mean, life can get really, really dark. And when I was writing this line, I, I started to write, life can get dark without Jesus. 
And I began to think about that, and I thought, that, well, that's true, but the truth is, life can get dark with or without Jesus. I don't know who's ready to be transparent and honest today, but the truth is I've been serving Jesus my entire life. I mean, since I was a teenager, I've been serving God and loving God. I didn't know I was doing so great. You know what I'm talking about, but but I'm doing it better now. But the the point is I've been serving God my whole life, and there have been seasons of my life where life gets dark. I've, I've never wanted to kill myself. I've never wanted to harm myself that way, but I will tell you this. I do know what it's like to be at a level of pain and hurt where you just want the hurt to go away. Can I get an amen from anybody who knows what I'm talking about? I I know it's church. I know it's Sunday and you're too blessed to be stressed and all that. But why don't you be honest for a second, right? I I know you got your Sunday clothes on and you just had your hands up and you were worshiping and doing all that. But the truth is it's possible to be saved, born again, love Jesus, walking with Jesus and life hits you with something that you never saw coming. And then immediately you find yourself in a dark place. And so what do you do? What do you do when you get to a dark place? I tell you, the key to overcoming dark season seasons is what you choose to do when you're in the dark. (laughs) <laughs> you want to know, you want to know how to make it through a dark season. You got to choose what it is you're going to do. Because when I look at Acts chapter 16, I see two people in the dark, but two people who respond differently. You got the jailer who's in the dark, who is trying to kill himself, who is desperate. But then you've got Paul who's in the dark, who's been beaten and stripped of his clothes, but he begins to lift his hands even in the dark and begin to worship God. I wish I had about five people who would lift their hands and worship God right now even in a dark season yes God come on somebody hallelujah what do you do in the dark you worship in the dark you pray in the dark you remind yourself who God is in the dark you remind yourself what God can do in every dark situation what I love about this jailer is that he called for the lights (laughs) I'm just telling you, when you get into a dark place, you know what you got to do? Call for the lights. (laughs) I need a light, man. It's dark. It's dark. This is what I love about the church. The church is a light. I mean, I can get out there in the world Monday through Saturday, and it gets dark, man. But what I love is that every Sunday at 8.30, 10 o'clock, 11.30, and 6, I'm guaranteed I can get in the light, praise God. That's what I love about groups. I can get in. Yeah, it might be get dark on Monday or Tuesday, but Wednesday night I'm going to be in a group, and there's going to be light right there, praise God. I can get out on Saturday and start ministering at the hangar and preparing that stuff for the Bahamas and I can be surrounded by light. And let me tell you one thing you need to know about light. Light is greater than darkness. Yeah, man, it gets dark sometimes. There's some dark areas, but light is always greater than darkness. I have never, ever walked into a dark room at my house and flipped on a light and darkness stayed. The moment I flip on the light, darkness is eradicated and leaves. Now, unless you don't pay your Duke bill, talk to me, somebody. Like, it is, <laughs> say amen, somebody. Like, if, if you don't pay the energy company, right, I mean, you can turn on, ain't nothing going to happen. But as long as you paid your bill, the moment I turn on the light, I've never had darkness stay when I flipped on light. It's because, oh, I feel God on this, but it's because light is greater than darkness, And the moment the light comes on, darkness is eradicated. We see this from the very beginning of the book of Genesis when the earth was without form and void and darkness was all over the universe. But God said, let there be light. And 186,000 miles per second light shot across the universe, illuminating every dark place. Just like God spoke light out of darkness, God can speak light into your life today. God can change your life today. God can change your situation today. And he can do it with a word. (laughs) Paul shouts out, he says, no, don't hurt yourself. Don't kill yourself. And the jailer asks for a light. Here's what I'm praying today. I'm praying if there's some people that are here that are in darkness, I'm praying that you'll ask for a light. Look look in Acts chapter 16. Notice that the jailer's asking for a light. And and in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 16, look what Paul prays. I I pray for you constantly asking God, the glorious Father of our Lord Jesus, to give you spiritual wisdom and insight that you might grow in your knowledge of God. 
I mean, every single one of us should be praying that we grow in the knowledge of God. If you're here today, you think you know Him, and you think you know all about Him, you don't. You still got to grow. I don't care if you've got 10 degrees. You still got to grow in your knowledge of God. And watch this very next verse. He says, I pray that your hearts will be flooded with... That's what we need. Life gets dark, but watch this. I pray that your hearts would be flooded with light so you can understand the confident hope that he has given to those that he has called. In Acts chapter 16, verse 30, the jailer asked the question, what must I do to be saved? And in verse 31, here's the answer. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Say it with me. Believe. Notice that the word is believe. Believe. Not all your religious junk that you want to add on to it. Here's what the Bible says. Believe. Not get your life cleaned up and get your life together and then come back. Get off the drugs. Get off the alcohol. Quit, quit uh, shacking up with that person that's not your husband. Then, no, watch this. Believe. What I love about God is that he meets you where you are. God takes you where you are. And the Bible says, there's only one correct answer to this question. What must I do to be saved? And the answer is, believe. Well, Pastor, I'm not so sure that that's the correct answer. I'm not so sure you've ever read a Bible. Because John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever... That's my told you so face. Go, go to Romans chapter 10, verse 9. Watch. If you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord, and if you believe, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Very next verse, watch this. For we believe. with our hearts, and so we are made right with God. Amen. I am made right with God the moment I believe. believe. Not the moment I believe and start getting it all together. God meets me when I don't have it together. I believe in him. In that moment, I am made right. Which means I'm in right standing with God. It's the word righteousness. We are made right. We declare with our mouths that we believe and we are saved. First Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. Just want to make sure you're getting it today. When you heard his message from us, you accepted it as the word of God, not the word of Pastor Jason. And it really is God's message, which works in you who. Believe. The starting line for everybody is to believe. believe. But what we do in church is that we, not necessarily this church, but maybe a church, what we do is when people come, we push back the starting line. People come, I, I, what, what more must I do to be saved, man? You got to get your junk together, man. You're not ready yet. You gotta, you, you gotta, you know, we keep pushing the starting line back. Quit pushing the line back. All you have to do is believe. That's where you start. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Believe in what Jesus did for you. Just this week I heard this story. I heard a guy telling this story and it was so powerful. I knew I wanted to tell it to you, but he was talking about John the Baptist and how John the Baptist in the beginning of his ministry, how he was preaching the message of repentance John the Baptist was the forerunner of Christ, right? He was preparing the way for Jesus to come and he was preaching a message of repentance and he was baptizing believers. He was offering people the opportunity to get clean. I don't care who you are, everybody wants that. Everybody wants a clear conscience. Everybody wants to be made whole and to be made clean. And we all got junk in the closet. We all got things we're not proud of, right? And so when you talk about a God who can wipe it all away, It appeals to every single one of us and John's out there in the wilderness and he's preaching repentance and he's preaching getting clean. And you know what happens? Thousands of people show up. Thousands and thousands of people show up and and believe. And I heard this guy say like, you know, nowadays we're so sophisticated with our services. You know, we got connect cards, you know, in the seat in front of you, there's a connect card and you can simply write your name and select, I want to follow Jesus. You know, he's like, he was saying, wouldn't it have been nice if we could help John the Baptist out, you know, a couple thousand years ago and we could have added our connect cards and all that nice stuff. Thousands of people coming in. He said, here's what we could have done. We, we could have had desks and people would walk up and they'd get a card and we would just ask like a couple questions. We'd say, what's your name? We'd write down their name. And then we'd ask them, what is your biggest sin? 
It kind of represents all their sin. And we would just ask them, what's your biggest one? And they would write that down. And then we would put that card on their shirt. And then they could walk over to a baptism tank and they could be baptized. It could have really helped them out. And if we would have done that, it would have looked something like this, right? We, we, we could have could have walked over to Carlin and we'd say, what's your name? And Carlin would say, my name's Carlin. And then we would ask Carlin, what's your biggest sin? And Carlin would say, um, um, I like other people's stuff. I like other people's stuff. And we'd say, okay, Carlin, you're a coveter. You are Carlin the coveter. And we would write it on his name and we would stick it on his chest and we'd say, go get clean. And so Alejandro, since you're enjoying that, we would next find you... <clears throat> and then we would ask you we would say what's your name and you say my name's Alejandro and then we'd ask you what's your biggest sin and you say my biggest sin is I sleep around <laughs> hypothetically church <laughs> hypothetically so we would write down, you're an adulterer, right? Or, or you're a fornicator, right? That's what you are. You're a fornicator. And so we'd write that and then we'd put it and we'd slap that on your, that name badge. We'd give you that name, fornicator. And we'd put that on and then you'd walk over and get baptized. And we'd just keep walking around and registering everybody and get everybody in. Mary, we'd grab you, right? Okay, your name is Mary. What's your biggest sin, right? Well, I don't always tell the truth. Okay, Mary, you're a liar. That's who you are. And so we would write a little card out, says, Mary the liar. And then we would put that on your shirt and we give that and you be go and you be cleansed. And while all this is going on, like at some point, while they're doing this process, they would ask the person, what's your name? And then somebody would walk up and he'd say, Jesus. I'd say, okay, Jesus, what's your biggest sin? And, and he would say, none. And then they say, okay, well, what's your smallest sin? <laughs> And Jesus would say, none. And then what Jesus would do is he'd start walking around to everybody else and he'd say, Carlin, the coveter. And he'd take that badge off of you and he'd put it on him. And he'd walk it over to Alejandro the adulterer and he'd take that card off you and he'd put it on him. And he'd walk over to Mary the liar and he'd go, oh, come on, somebody, if you believe it. He'd pull the card off you and he'd put it on him. This is who Jesus is. Come on, give him a praise. Watch this. This is exactly who Jesus is, and this is exactly what he did. He took all the labels that were on us, all of our sin, all of our issues. He took every single one of them, and he put it upon himself. But watch this. It gets better. Because this is the part like most churches forget. You can't forget this part. Not only does he take our badge, but he gives his badge to us. So, So we get the badge that says holy. We get the badge that says righteous. We get the badge that says pure, perfect. Watch this, sinless. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. See anybody getting this today? The old things are gone and all things have become. About eight years ago, I was in Santo Domingo, the Dominican Republic. It was my first time on a mission trip there, and I went with another guy, and I, I didn't know him all that well. Uh, FYI, don't go to third world countries with people you don't know that well. So I, I went, he, watch this. He's a good guy. He loves Jesus. I'm, not, I'm just saying, lesson learned. Okay, so we went to the Dominican Republic, and our first night there, we're in the city in Santo Domingo. It's just him and I, and we wanted to go down and eat. And, and I speak about this much Spanish, and he's fluent. So we went down there, and we started eating. We're in the city, and we meet this guy. The guy starts talking to us. And uh, have you ever met somebody and just immediately know, somebody right about this dude? It's called discernment. It's a gift of the Spirit. And, and the Holy Spirit gives that to us. And so... I don't know, just something about this dude, man. The first time I saw him, man, my spidey senses were tingling, man. Something wasn't right. I just, I just thought, man, this, nah, 
I don't, I don't know. So I don't feel right about this. And we started walking around this guy. Oh, let me show you this. Let me show you that. So we start walking all over the city. But I was fine when we were in the areas that were lit. But the more we started walking, the darker the places started getting. And I remember we were crossing a street. And there was a taxi parked right there. And I heard the Spirit of God in my heart say, son, get in the car. Get in the taxi. It was an audible voice. I, I mean, in my heart, in my spirit. I believe the Holy Spirit said, get in the car, Jason, get in the car, don't go with this dude, and then I'm having this inner struggle, is that you, God, is that not you, you better know the voice of God so that when he speaks, you don't have to ask questions, and the truth is, I'd love to tell you that I just got in the car, but I didn't. And I walked past the car and I remember we were crossing streets and we'd walk a block and cross the street. And and every time we would walk, I would know in my heart, this isn't right. This isn't right. This isn't good. I'd even tell the dude I was with, man, you feel good about this? He's like, oh yeah, we're fine. I'm like, dude, we're not fine. This is not good. And I said in my heart, God, if if you'll bring a taxi to that next street, I'll be the first one on it. And as soon as I walked into the front of the street, a taxi pulled up just like that. I said to my friend, peace out, homie. I'm out of here. (laughs) And he decided to go with me, which was smart on his part. And we hopped in that taxi and we took it back to the hotel. And the next day when I was talking with some church leaders in that area, they said, we saw you and we saw who you were with yesterday. He's one of the most notorious drug dealers in this city. You were walking around with him. I'm so thankful that God whispers in our ear. That God loves us so much that when we're about to really screw things up, He whispers in our ear. And that if we'll listen and if we'll obey, God will help us today. Would you stand up all over this sanctuary, everywhere that you are? Here's what I'm praying for and here's what I'm believing God for. I'm believing that right now in this service that God is whispering in somebody's ear. In fact, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt you can't get this many people in a room and God not speak to somebody. No, God's speaking. God's whispering in somebody's ear. And probably somebody who's in a dark place. Somebody probably who's in a dark season of life. And it gets dark, and it doesn't just get dark for you, it gets dark for everybody. But when you get in the dark, the one thing we learn is that you got to ask for light. you got to ask, I need light, I need the light of God's presence to shine in these areas of darkness in my life today. I believe in my heart that God might just be whispering into somebody's heart today saying, receive me. Save me. I can't help but think that God might be whispering in somebody's heart just saying this one word, believe. Believe. Today. And I guarantee you, somebody right now is trying to rationalize things away. So somebody's saying, oh, you next service. Next service. Somebody's going to try to justify. the na- that, That's what I did. I wish to God I would have got in the first taxi on the first street. I'm saying to you, learn from my mistakes. Don't wait. I don't know that there is another taxi. So what I'm saying today is, what must I do to be saved? Here's what you do. Believe and receive the Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks for checking out this video. Click our logo to subscribe so you never have to miss a thing. Also, check out our other social media pages if you want to stay up to date with everything that's happening at the Lakeside Church. Thanks for watching.